Coming up, former co-host Christy Watts joins us in the studio. And can I put these bands down? One more time, come on. She opens up about her faith, finding true happiness, and her new book, Talk Yourself Happy. Plus, a church in the heartland of America whose congregation comes from around the world. He wanted us to be a place that would bless people who couldn't bless us back. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. According to the United Nations, the resolution that was passed last month, the old city of Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory. But the Jews who live there have a very different view. They say it's home. Supporters of Israel say the UN resolution ignores more than 3,000 years of Jewish history. Chris Mitchell brings us the story from Jerusalem. The UN Security Council resolution took the dramatic step of declaring all settlements in Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank, occupied Palestinian territory. The Security Council specifically includes East Jerusalem, which includes the Old City. That encompasses the Temple Mount behind me, where King Solomon built the first Jewish temple 3,000 years ago. Jesus taught in the second Jewish temple about 2,000 years ago, built by King Herod. It also includes the City of David and Mount Zion, the location of the Last Supper. And below the Temple Mount is the Western Wall, where Christians and Jews from around the world come to pray. We're going to continue to build, we're going to continue to be here, we're going to continue to enjoy the sun in the midst of the wind and the rain. Moshe Kampinski is a shop owner in the Jewish quarter of the Old City, now considered illegal by the UN. There's a whole different, almost jovial attitude to people who are coming here. They know why they're here, they know this is where they need to be, and they're sort of smiling at, look at me, I'm the new criminal that's come into occupied territory. This isn't occupied territory. This has been the place of God's presence and the place of his people for 3,000 years. It was uh, embarrassing that the United States abstained. I think it was uh, almost unforgivable. Former governor and presidential candidate Mike Huckabee told CBN News that the U.S. abstention betrayed its friend and ally. The uh, failure to uh, veto the resolution at the U.N was not only a slap in the face of our friend Israel, but it was a slap in the face of Donald Trump as well, leaving a mess that he will have to try to clean up. Huckabee believes the incoming Trump administration will work to reverse the resolution. I think ultimately it's going to be reversed because I expect that Donald Trump and his administration will make it very clear that if, if this kind of action against one of our allies is going to stand, uh, again, an anti-Semitic act of hate, that if necessary, I mean, I'd like to see the president the like say, we'll pull out of the UN. Trump has already sent positive signals to Israel with the nomination of David Friedman as U.S. ambassador to Israel and calling for the U.S. embassy to be moved to Jerusalem. In the meantime, Kempinski says the UN resolution clarified even more why he's in the Jewish quarter. In many ways, it's almost like I want to thank the UN for making it so clear that their position makes no logical sense, no historical sense, and my position getting up in the morning, coming to this place which they claim is occupied territory and returning to the place that we've been here for 3,000 years makes all the sense in the world. And there could be more. In the last days of his administration, many fear President Obama might try another move to delegitimize Israel. The most likely opportunities would be at the upcoming Paris Peace Conference on January 15th or some other resolution before the Trump inauguration on January 20th. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, The Jewish Quarter, Old City, Jerusalem. Well, this is a significant development. It happened right before Christmas Eve, right before the day before Hanukkah, uh, and it has created a firestorm of controversy. Why in the world would the United States turn its back on its traditional ally? And understand, this is not some, uh, you know, redo of precedent at the UN. This is a brand new thing to say it's blatantly illegal. That's a direct quote from the re resolution. It's blatantly illegal for Israel to occupy uh, the East Jerusalem. Uh, that, that, 
it, just start understanding what's involved in that. You're dealing with the Western Wall. You're dealing with the Temple Mount. You're dealing with the Jewish cemetery that has been there for centuries on the Mount of Olives. You're dealing with what we always have called the Jewish Quarter. Now, go back in history, the Jewish quarter uh, was obviously occupied by Jews, and you go back just a hundred years and you find a very vibrant Jewish community there. Uh, that was all wiped out in 1949 by the Jordanians. Uh, they invaded as part of the 1948 war, and uh, they took it all, and they took the entire West Bank. In 1967, that's when Israel took it back and the Jewish quarter was once again populated by Jews. But under the Jordanians, what happened? You had an ethnic cleansing where the Jewish population in the Jewish quarter went down to zero. And you look at all the, the synagogues that were desecrated, the synagogues that were destroyed, uh, the Jewish cemeteries where Jordanian soldiers built latrines on top of them. Uh, you get an idea of what would happen under a Palestinian rule of the same territory. Uh, that's not a future I want to see, and I'm just absolutely shocked. The United States, the State Department, our, our current administration would go along with that uh, and say that this is all subject to bargaining and negotiation and it's blatantly illegal. Uh, no, the Jews have a right to Jerusalem. It has been their city, it's been their city for thousands of years, and it needs to be undivided and the capital of Israel. Well, in other news, President-elect Donald Trump is meeting with intelligence chiefs today. He's being briefed about Russian interference in the U.S. election. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. Trump's made no secret of his skepticism of those claims. Intelligence officials say Russia hacked the DNC and other leading Democrats. But WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange says it received the material from another source and that Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta, had such an easy password, a teenager could have figured it out. House Speaker Paul Ryan says Trump is right to be concerned about partisans using Russian, Russian hacking to question the legitimacy of his victory. Trump has picked former Indiana Senator Dan Coats as the new director of national intelligence, though Coats has been a harsh critic of the Russian government. Four black suspects face a judge today in Chicago. They're charged with a hate crime in the assault of a white man with special needs. The Chicago team streamed the brutal attack on social media. Charlene Aaron has a story. Chicago police say felony charges are expected against the four who beat the 18-year-old man in an assault that was broadcast live on Facebook. Look at him. Tied up. The video shows suspects Jordan Hill, Tesfaye Cooper, along with Brittany and Tanisha Covington, beating and taunting the man. The suspects can be heard in the video using racial slurs against whites and President-elect Donald Trump. Say Donald Trump. Investigators call the vicious attack sickening, saying the assault went on for hours until police found the man disoriented and walking along a street. Let me be very clear. The actions in that video are reprehensible. That along with racism have absolutely no place in the city of Chicago or anywhere else for that matter against anyone, regardless of their race, gender, state of mental health, or any other identifying factor. Police say the victim, a suburban resident, reported missing by his family, was held for two days, bound, beaten, cut with a knife, forced to drink toilet water, and verbally abused by his captors. It appears that he was in that physical position, tied up in the corner, for about four or five hours. It's terrible. And so part of what uh, technology allows us to see now is, is the terrible toll that uh, racism and discrimination and hate uh, takes on families and communities. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Turning to other news, the South is bracing for a powerful winter storm this weekend, and people as far south as Alabama are gearing up. Alabama's governor issued a state of emergency to open its emergency operations center Friday morning. He also put 300 National Guard soldiers at the ready. 
Other parts of the country like Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia are also preparing for the storm. Areas of North Carolina and Southeast Virginia could get up to 10 inches of snow. Terry, we'll send it back to you. Well, I'm going to be building a snowman this weekend. I don't know about the rest of you, but might as well enjoy it if it's coming. Stay home if you can, because driving in it is a mess, as you can see. Well, coming up, a church with services in four different languages and a congregation that speaks more than 15 dialects. It's a place where if you're thirsty, you'll get something to drink. If you're hungry, you'll get fed. If you don't have a place, you'll find a place. And if you don't have a family, you'll join ours. See how this church in Iowa is reaching refugees from across the world after this. Churches have become more involved in the international refugee crisis. You hear a lot of bad news today. This is some really good news. And one congregation in Iowa is setting a high standard as they reach out to people in need from across the world. Abigail Robertson shows us what they're doing. Good morning. How are you? Zion Lutheran is not your average church. On any given Sunday, they offer services in four different languages, and those attending speak over 15 dialects. The inspiration that transformed this 150-year-old ministry into a 24-7 mission field came from one simple question. If our church closed, would anyone miss us? There was no consequence. Can you imagine being a pastor of a church that really doesn't have a reason to exist? Cleaning out the gum. In 2010, they prayed about the future of the church. God's answer revealed an unexpected plan. Everybody got their seatbelts on? In Luke 14, we learned that he wanted us to be a place that would bless people who couldn't bless us back. So they took box lunches to a nearby low-income apartment complex, housing refugees from all over the world. They asked each person, how can we bless you? We didn't plan anything, we just walked down the street and everything unfolded because it's just a matter of faithfulness to God. Zion began making weekly visits and also brought refugee children back to the church for tutoring. As word of their work spread, they caught the attention of a group of Burmese Christian refugees. The Mizus had been worshiping in a small apartment and needed a bigger space. When I talked with Pastor John, he was like, everything you want to do, you can do it. This is God's house, not my church or no one's church. This is God's house. Zion welcomed the Mizus in and gave them a service time. Then the church went a step further, sending someone to Burma to bring over a new associate pastor who spoke their own dialect. The first service was very, Emotional. We can freely worship in our style, in our language, you know, it's very awesome. Now the mission offers Arabic and Swahili services, along with a diverse youth program reaching over 300 students. It's a place where if you're thirsty, you'll get something to drink. If you're hungry, you'll get fed. If you don't have a place, you'll find a place. And if you don't have a family, you'll join ours. These communities not only use the church, they've become an invaluable part of it. When we came here, we didn't have, you know, the language to tell our story. We didn't have, you know, people to help us because we didn't know them. But now we have this community. We have all these people surrounding us. When refugees arrive, no matter their religion or language, Zion helps with tutoring, resettlement assistance, oh, yeah. and friendships in their new home. Every day, people bring in donations that fill Zion's main lobby. Refugees from around the community are welcome to come and take whatever they need. When refugees come, there's a limited time when they need the most. And when you can invest in their lives, say, Jesus loves you, like with these Syrians, you know? It's like, no, you matter, and I care about your eternity. Ministering in this way isn't always easy. Many of Zion's new members lost family to war. 
and others come from different sides of civil wars. The biggest challenge is being a mission field 24-7. People don't want to suffer. And to walk into the lives of these people is to walk into their suffering and into the suffering of their nations. Zion's slogan is where the nations worship. People say coming here feels like a taste of heaven. We may have different accents uh, in singing, we may play instrument different, but God is one. It's not always easy making a place like Zion work, but on Sunday when all the nations come together to worship God, the result is just beautiful. Reporting from Des Moines, Iowa, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, the result is just beautiful, and we all need to open our eyes that the current refugee crisis, it can be looked as a current refugee opportunity. Uh, how can we take the gospel to them? How can we be the hands and feet of Jesus to them? How can we establish ourselves as biblical models of the church, uh, not just a building, but a place where people can get help? Well, there's another side to this refugee crisis, and certainly in the election, we heard a lot about um, Muslim registries and what should we do about the immigration crisis coming out of Syria. But there's another side to it, and you may not have heard about it. Here's what a federal judge, his name is Daniel Mannion, and he wrote it in an opinion last October. Of the nearly 11,000 refugees admitted by mid-September, that's 2016, only 56 of these Syrian refugees were Christian. It's well documented that refugees to the United States are not representative of that war-torn area of the world. Perhaps 10% of the population of Syria is Christian, and yet less than one half of 1% of Syrian refugees admitted to the United States this year are Christian. We need to open our eyes here. Uh, what is going on with our current administration? What is going on with the immigration policies that have been set up? There is a genocide happening to Christian communities in the Middle East. And it's not just in Syria, it's also in Iraq. And have we closed our doors to the Christians who are in desperate need in these areas. Uh, I think we need a congressional investigation into this. Why uh, were, were Christians excluded? Uh, why, why in the world would we, we do that? Uh, and what can we do now to open our doors to say, how can we receive, how can we be a place of aid to the Christians who are suffering severe persecution? Uh, this is an ongoing genocide. And we need to wake up to it and wake up to the policies of our own government. Terry? I think Iowa just showed us one of the ways we can do that. Yes. <laughs> well, up next, a cheating husband comes clean to his wife. She said, I knew it. I knew something was going on with you. And uh, she was very angry, and rightfully so. I was so ashamed. I just wanted to hide. Watch where he runs next and see how it saves their marriage after this. After years of stress at home and stress on the job, Tim Wright was running on empty. Then in a moment of weakness, Tim made a choice and it nearly wrecked what was once a happy marriage. We were both just madly in love with each other. We were so in love, and we just, we knew that it was the Lord's will. When Tim and Lisa Wright married in 1982, they wanted their marriage to reflect their Christian faith. Over the next 20 years, they were involved in different ministries, started a family, and Tim later took a job teaching at a Christian university. And gradually, their relationship fell to the bottom of their list of priorities. My whole focus became the kids, pretty much. I was very busy with the job. We just weren't connecting on an interpersonal level. At the same time, legalistic teachings from their church caused him to doubt himself and especially his relationship with God. All of a sudden, it just didn't seem real anymore. It seemed like, oh, you got to worry about the image. It's not a real encounter. More and more, I felt like 
I can't do this. I don't, I felt like I just didn't measure up. Tim was getting a, a bit hard-hearted and distant towards me, towards the family, towards God. He began to change. That was something that really taught me how to pray because I couldn't change his heart. You know, he had to choose us. Tim eventually stopped going to church and over the next couple of years, continued to drift from his family, putting his time and energy into work. It was there he met a woman who caught his attention. I made her laugh. Uh, she made me laugh and it just became, uh, oh wow, this, there's another person out here who actually likes me. And never dreaming that it would ever slip over into an affair. And then it did, uh, and it was a short-lived thing, uh, literally uh, overnight. I couldn't function. I was so ashamed, I just wanted to hide. The next morning, Tim told Lisa what happened. She said, I knew it. I knew something was going on with you. And uh, she was very angry, and rightfully so. It felt deeply painful, just that sense of, rejection, that, that sense of betrayal. Like, God, I'm gonna need a lot of help for my heart to be mended, because my heart was broken. Tim also told his colleagues and had to resign his position. He and Lisa went to counseling, but Tim felt the damage had already been done. I did not feel like I could change. I felt like it was like, you know what, I'm, I'm done, I, I'm disqualified. You know, it's like uh, you don't fix things like that. You throw them away. Even though Tim had given up on their marriage and himself, Lisa did not. I felt like God gave me forgiveness in my heart immediately as a, as a gift. I literally said to Lord, if this is what you're going to use to bring him back to you, God, then that's what, that's what I want you to do. They didn't tell their children all that was going on, but their daughter, Clara, knew something wasn't right. All I knew was my dad was basically gone. Like, I felt like he wasn't my dad anymore. I just withdrew from my family. I was uh, talking to psychics. I was talking to people from other religions, just trying to find something that was real. After a couple of years and things not really changing, I said, you have to get help or this isn't gonna work. So Tim reached out to a close friend who took him to a worship service. I just sat on the floor leaning up against the wall and was listening. Then something shifted. <laughs> it's like when that's when the, whole, when the Holy Spirit showed up. And it's just like something just pierced my heart. And it's like, it was the, re you know, it's like, whoa, what's that? I think I had experienced hope for the first time. It's like, oh, maybe this is real. Tim went back to the services again and again. It wasn't like one event and, you know, ah, the angels, it was a wooing. <laughs> It was just like the presence of the Lord, like, I'm here. I'm just going to hold you for a while. We're not going to talk. I'm not going to give you any, any intellectual type stuff. I'm just going to be here. Tim finally had the real encounter with God he had been missing. And it was then he began repairing his relationship with his wife and children. I would go to them individually and just, I, I just asked them for their forgiveness. And uh, there were a lot of tears. I started seeing the, the real Tim again. As he encountered the love of God, I felt that he was able to love me. Tim and Lisa are once again happily married. And together, they're doing ministry all around the world. I am more in love with my wife now than I've, I've, I've ever been. The Lord is a master at taking things that are broken and, and healing them if we allow him to. He is a supernatural, miracle-working God. He can change the situation and, and bring the love back and reconcile and redeem like He did ours, our marriage. <laughs> he does like to take the broken and fix it and make it all new again. 
I want to talk to those who think that somehow or other you've disqualified yourself. That's what Tim thought. He thought he was disqualified. That a righteous God could never love him again. That he could never have that intimacy. He could never be able to approach him. That he had messed up too much. And, and he thought, well, this is what happens when you're broken. You get thrown away. Uh, you aren't any good anymore. Well, if you've ever felt that, I've got the best news in the world. Jesus can restore anyone from anything. That's what he came to do. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to set the captive free. And he wants to do that for you. You're captured by your sin. You're captured by the thoughts that you've disqualified yourself. You're captured by this. But realize his love never fails. All that it takes, all that's required is for you to surrender to him. To turn from what you're doing, and if what you're doing is wrong, turn quickly from it. Turn away from it. And say, Jesus, I can't fix this, but you can. I can't fix me, but you can. And when you have that, that surrender, well, then you'll find what Tim found. He found a new life. He found that God hadn't thrown him away. He found forgiveness. He found restoration. And that is available for you. All you have to do is ask for it. Turn from what you're doing. Turn away from it. And, 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 and just turn to him and say, Jesus, help me. From my innermost being, cry out, I need you. And if you'll do that, he'll answer you. The Bible says that when we seek him with all of our heart, we'll find him. Don't deny that he has the ability. He's a miracle worker, and he can work a miracle in your life, in your marriage. He can restore. He can rebuild. He can make you new again. If you want this, don't turn away. Don't live another day feeling that you're worthless. But right now, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer and let Jesus do all the rest. What he's done for Tim, what he's done for others, he's ready, willing, and able to do for you. Let's pray. Jesus, that's right, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus. I come to you, and I just confess I have made a mess of my life. I can't fix it. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. But I turn to you, and I ask right now that you would forgive me, that you would set me free from it, that you would restore me, and make me new again, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you would give to me the joy of salvation. Hear my prayer. Hear my prayer, Lord Jesus. I have nowhere else to turn but to you. Come into my heart. Be with me and let me know that my prayer has been heard and has been answered today. Do it, Lord, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Father, I just ask for a baptism in forgiveness. Let them know that their prayer has been heard, has been answered. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Make them new, for I ask it. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you just prayed with me, there's one more thing that I want you to do. I want you to make a phone call. And if you have things that you need to confess, we're here for you. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to condemn you. We're here to let you know that God loves you and he is able to forgive. He's able to cleanse. He's able to make you new. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. When you call, we've got a free packet for you. It's called A New Day. And what do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? How do you walk it out day by day? And if just like Tim and Lisa, you're having trouble with your marriage, if there are consequences to your actions that have impacted your marriage, all you have to do is call us and we want you to have this. It's a wonderful brochure. It's called Love and Marriage. God's plan for your family. If you call us, we can email it to you right away. All you have to do is pick up the phone. 1-800-700-7000. Terry, over to you. Well, coming up later on today's program, former 700 Club co-host Christy Watts. Christy's going to talk candidly about the pain in her past and tell us all how she learned to talk herself happy by speaking God's promises. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The military of Nigeria says soldiers have found one of the nearly 300 girls who were captured by the radical Islamic group Boko Haram almost three years ago. She was found along with her six-month-old baby. Most of the girls remain in captivity. Less than two dozen have been freed. Boko Haram forced the captured girls to convert to Islam, and many of them were also forced to marry Islamic fighters. The kidnapped girls are from Chibok, a small Christian enclave in mainly northern Nigeria. Many of the parents of the girls are translating the Bible into local languages. Well, a school in Peru has gotten much needed help from Operation Blessing to bring safe water and better hygiene for their students. In the community of Makake Amarca, there is only one school. It has 55 children, but there was no safe water for them to drink. Students also had to share a single bathroom, and without water, there was no way for them to wash their hands. Thanks to Operation Blessing, the students now have clean water, three bathrooms, and two hand washing stations. The water system will not only help the students, but will give the entire community clean water. And you can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to their website at ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club right after this. In 1999, Christy Watts started working at the 700 Club, first as a producer and then later as co-host. She's remembered for her engaging personality, her unique style, the fun of being with Christy, but also some of her more memorable interviews deeper with media mogul Tyler Perry, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Take a look. Christy Watts was known for her upbeat personality as a co-host for the 700 Club. Shouldn't you be doing this with me? And can I put these bands down? One more time, come on. But after her divorce, Christy was anything but joyful. Many of us uh, who've experienced divorce, it's an excruciating, painful situation. That pain left her discouraged and disappointed in her faith, the very faith she shared on air with millions of viewers. In her book, Talk Yourself Happy, Christy reveals how she found true happiness after heartache and shares how she used her mind and her words to radically change her future. She's back and we're so glad she is. Christy Watts, welcome Yay! back home to Thank the 700 you, Club. It's Thank great you. to have you here. Thank you. Y you know, you have always been fun and mm. people love to see you on camera. Your your personality just comes through at 150 watts, if you'll excuse them. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> but nobody knew or realized during the time that you were doing the 700 Club that your life was really going through a very different place. Mm. You married, had a happy life, pregnant with your first baby, came home with the baby on Thursday, mm -hmm. and Saturday, your ex-husband walked out. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, had my son on a Thursday came home from the hospital Saturday and Sunday, so one day away, he walked wow. out. And one of the last things he said to me was, I never loved you. And the second thing he said was, you used to be so pretty. Look at you now. 
And that was the beginning of me understanding the impact of words and how words can destroy yeah. and harm and tear down and really began a journey of me realizing that not just the words that I speak have power, but the words that other people speak to me have power and shape my perspective. If you let them. If I yes. let them. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is whose word are we going to believe? Amen. Their word or the word, yeah. which is the word of God. Well, that's what the book Talk Yourself Happy is all about. Yeah. It's not all flowers and sunshine. It's really the struggle of learning exactly what you just said. Yeah. Because we know these things, Christy. Mm -hmm. You know, we know there's power in the word of God. But yeah. when you're in the pit, mm -hmm. Reaching up and grabbing hold of the promise and making it your own yeah. is a battle. How did you do that? Well, here's the deal, Terry. Most of us, 99% of us, talk ourselves miserable yeah. all day, every day. We always talk about what's wrong, what God isn't doing, what is not happening. What someone did to us. What someone did to us all day, every day. Yeah. And we talk ourselves miserable. And God... He wants us to, to begin to talk ourselves happy by encouraging ourselves with the Word of God. But here's the deal, Terry. How many of us Christians really know the Word of God? Yeah. We go to church. We're like, oh, we love Jesus. We mm -hmm. love this, da, da, da. But do we know who God is? Do we know His Word? And we do, do we know how to take the Word of God and make it applicable in our own lives? Well, you know, I think also, Christy, that we... Even when we do know the Word of God, yeah. when we're in that pit, we feel kind of righteous about our grumbling and our grousing because, I mean, we really have been yeah. wounded by someone, put down by someone, rebuked by someone, had something ripped away from us by someone. So part of the, the lesson in here and yeah. part of the miracle yeah. of the promise is when we don't feel like it, yeah. doing it. Right. Even even that God had to give you the grace for. Right, right. But see, that's the thing too. It's here's 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 some truth serum. A lot of times when we take scripture and we just quote it all day, every day, yet we still feel like it just as soon as it comes out of our mouth, it just, you know, disperses in the wind. The truth of the matter is, the Bible says that out of the heart. Yeah comes the words that we speak. So proceeds the words that we speak. So it's really a heart issue, not just a word issue. Mm -hmm. And for me, God had to teach me, Christy, you can quote scriptures all day, every day, but what does your heart really say? And for me, it was when I got to that deep place, the heart place, the pit, the difficult time in my life, when I quoted scripture, I prayed and I fasted, but yet nothing else could get me out of that pit. It was when that word came alive and that word of Jesus Christ. And people always wanna know how I got the title, Talk Yourself Happy. Here's the truth. It was New Year's Day and nothing, nothing was happening the way that I thought it was gonna happen and I was miserable. And my mom called me, she was trying to encourage me and nothing worked. And I'd cried for five days straight. And all of a sudden she started talking about my sister, something that was going on with her. And then I said, well, Remind her when the Lord did this and remind her when the Lord did that. And when I started to speak what God had done and remind myself about my personal experiences with the Lord and the goodness of God, that spirit of oppression and oppression started to yes. raise up and raise off of me. And I said, girl, I just talked myself happy. And there was a principle in that. It wasn't just speaking, quoting scriptures. It was reminding ourselves of the person of God, the word mm -hmm. of God, activated by the power of God and the Holy Spirit. And as I read your book, I thought God never calls us to anything that he doesn't also supply what we need right. for. And here you are a single mom mm. raising a young boy yeah. who had never met his dad for what 11 was 12, it, 12 years, years? Yeah. yeah then you get a call from your ex-husband yeah. and the whole thing in some ways comes back to start yeah how did you handle that years ago I would have handled it very differently mm. and here's the truth I was a host for the 700 Club for 14 years, but I sat on this set with a level of arrogance. Mm. It was very easy for me to say, God is good. Yeah. It was very easy to, for me to look at the audience and say, trust God, because life was good. And it was easy to trust when life was good. But it was in that place where God had to humble me yeah. in every aspect of my life, where I couldn't hold on to circumstances or, or jobs or finances or houses or any of these things, I had to hold on to God. And when I held on to Him, that's when He began to take off those hardened things in my heart and transform my heart. So to answer your question, 
when 11 years later, when I get a phone call from my ex-husband, who I hadn't heard from from years, who says, Christy, I want to come see you and your son. And I'm like, why? And he says, because I have stage three, stage four cancer, and I've been given three months to live. Mm. The arrogant Christy where, then yeah. would have been like, Psh. Yeah, where have you been? Where have you mm-hmm. been? But this Christy was able to look at a man and have compassion because just like God had compassion for me, saw me in my suffering and loved me through it, how could I not have that same heart for someone else, which I did for my ex-husband? And not only gave him grace as he was coming to a place of eternal consequence, but gave yes. your son the gift of meeting his father. That was hard, Terry. Yeah, I can't that even That was imagine. really hard because when he called, he'd never met his own son before. When he walked out, he walked out for good. Now here, I'm faced with a decision. Do I do what I feel like doing, which is to shut that door and slam that phone down? Or do I say, okay, because here's the crust. Do I let this man, let my son meet his father and then he dies? Or do I not let my son meet his father and he, and, and, you know, it'll never happen. never happen. Like, what do I do? What do I do? Mm. And I said, what would Jesus do? And I said, okay, that heart of compassion, of course. And my son met him. And um, it was a unique experience. You know, we are skimming the tip of the iceberg here because there's so much more in your book, but there's not a one of us that doesn't go through life with some challenges, with some difficult places. Maybe you find yourself today in a pit like Christy found herself. Most of us have been there and done that at least once in life. What do you do? Well, I love the subtitle of this book, Transform Your Heart by Speaking God's Promises Just do it. Christy's book is called Yourself Happy. It's available wherever books are sold. It's wonderful to have you back here and what a message you bring. Right. Thank Thank you you so much. Yeah. Your joy. Thank you. We're going to be back with more of the 700 Club after this. So stay with us. Get the book. Well, millions of children around the world are learning the stories of the Bible through CBN's Superbook. In the Philippines, one boy is doing more than just watching the stories. He's applying them to his life. 13-year-old Albert never misses an episode of his new favorite TV show, Superbook. When I saw the burning bush where God spoke to Moses, I knew there was something extraordinary about the show. One day, Albert heard that his favorite Superbook character, Gizmo, was coming to his city for a visit. He asked his mom if he could go. Unfortunately, they couldn't even afford bus fare to the event. I prayed to God and asked for wisdom on how I can raise the money for bus fare. He gave me the idea to collect plastic bottles to recycle. Albert worked hard and earned enough money to go to the Superbook event. I had so much fun with the other children who love Superbook too. My favorite part was when I had my picture taken with Gizmo. A few months later, Albert submitted a drawing to a Superbook art contest, and he won. When they called to tell me that I won a Superbook DVD, I was so excited to get it. I had always wanted one, but didn't have the money to get it. I treasured my first DVD so much, I put it under my pillow when I sleep. Albert wanted to buy a second DVD, so once again he started collecting bottles to recycle. Then Albert's mom got sick and couldn't work for a month. So Albert gave his mom all the money he'd saved up to buy that second Superbook DVD. I thought of the Superbook episode, The Test. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. He obeyed because he loved God. At first, it was hard, but I was happy to sacrifice my savings because I love my mom. CBN learned about Albert, so we gave him some more DVDs of his favorite Superbook episodes. It's just like what happened to Chris in Superbook. God sees our sacrifices and blesses us back with what we really want. I'm so happy. Superbook makes my faith in God stronger. You can make faith in God stronger for children around the world. It's amazing what's happening. We're we're closing in on 50 languages where Superbook has been translated, and it's just amazing the results. Our surveys are showing incredible numbers of people are watching uh, these these Superbook episodes. The surveys are 
180 million people last year. Just absolutely incredible. The biggest audiences are in the Philippines, where the ratings show three and a half million people watching every Saturday morning. And then there's Indonesia, 650,000 to 700,000 in Jakarta. Uh, what, what, what happens when you get these stories out is that children get encouraged. Uh, they get encouraged to believe in God, to believe that there's a Savior, to believe that there's a, a place for them with Him. And you can be a part of it. How? By joining the Superbook DVD Club. Now, for a gift of $25 or more, we'll send you the latest episode we've got. We've got this wonderful Superbook Explorer series, and you'll get two episodes of Superbook, plus all the archaeology and history that went into the episode, and then the theology of the episode. How does this episode fit within God's plan of salvation? So you get not just one copy of it, you'll get three copies, so you can share this particular episode with your friends, your family. And then as a bonus, you'll have 26 Superbook episodes unlocked for you on the Superbook app, where you can watch it on a tablet, on a smartphone, on smart TVs. It's all part of being a member of the Superbook DVD Club. So if you want to be a part of it, if you want to be a part of the production costs, the translation costs, the distribution costs, so the children of the world can get the stories of the Bible, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000 and just say, I want to join the Superbook DVD Club. So do it now. Call us now, 1-800-700-7000. Well, we're going to be right back with more of the 700 Club right after this. to bring it on with some of the email questions that you've sent in. And Gordon, this first one comes from Scarlett, who says, what does the word grace mean? Does it mean love? Scarlett, it actually doesn't mean love. There are plenty of Greek words for love uh, in, the, in the New Testament. Uh, agape is the, is the number one, where it's this unconditional love. Uh, grace, charis, is unmerited favor. That's what it means, unmerited favor where you are loved just because of you. Uh, in, in, in our human understanding, uh, we always think that we have to do certain things, that there's some kind of uh, exchange, a quid pro quo, if you will, of if I'm good enough, God will pay attention to me. If I do the right things, if I go to Sunday school every single you know, Sunday, if I uh, read my Bible, if I fast enough, if if I tithe enough and all these things that uh, somehow or other God's going to smile on me. Well, the great news is that you have unmerited favor. You can't earn it. You can't uh, achieve for it. It's because of who you are. And the more you understand that identity, that you are a child of God, and this happens before you're saved, realize God created Adam and Eve. He created them for a garden. He created them for communion with him. And that creation has not been severed by our sin. We're still his children. Now, we need to be restored to the family. We need to ask for forgiveness. We need to ask for salvation and receive it. But that favor that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just dwell in that favor, dwell in that identity, and it'll transform you. You'll be able to say, I get to go boldly to daddy's throne. I get to go to that throne of grace because of who he is and how he loves me. This is Nanette who says, what causes me to cry when I pray, especially when I pray for someone in person? Is it something to be embarrassed about? Oh, please don't be embarrassed about it. It's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. You're having um, the, the beginnings, if you will, of the groanings that cannot be uh, uttered. It's, it's a sign that you're an intercessor. It's a sign that you're filled with compassion. Don't be embarrassed by it, but embrace it and realize you're really identifying with the person you're praying for. Yeah, I like when somebody's praying for me and they're moved to tears. I feel like they understand my need in a 
a deeper way. So. Yeah, it connects you. Exactly. It connects you in ways that uh, nothing else really works. Yeah, it's wonderful. Well, thanks for your questions. We don't have time for any more today, but we appreciate hearing from you always. All right. Well, we have some wonderful words from Matthew chapter 5. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And today, keep in mind what that wonderful church is doing for the refugees. They're letting their light shine before men. That, that, that God would be glorified, not them, but that God would be glorified. And through that, they're leading many to salvation. You can do that too. All you have to do is let your light shine. For Terry, for me, for all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again.